Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and providing a ton of tiny, tiny little PCBs for us to look at building custom lightweight switches. Hello everybody, I am Ben from Team Panic. So switches are a simple thing, right? You take two bits of metal, you connect them to a circuit, and then when you touch them, they join and the electricity goes through the circuit. That's it, that is a switch in its entirety. There is a ton of different ways about going and doing this, and obviously they are necessary in combat robots as a isolation element for safety reasons. Being able to turn your entire robot off is very, very, very important. And as such, there are a ton of different switch options out there already, and different weight classes use different things. So recently in my 150 gram and one pound robots, I have been using toggle switches and slide switches for doing this job and actually switching the power in the robot. They have been working, they're able to handle the current in the robots that I'm building, but the big problem with toggle and slide switches is that, especially slide switches, in a big hit, they can be turned off. The force and momentum in the hit can shunt the entire slide, turning the robot off without any actual damage having been taken by the robot. That is a problem. So I decided that I wanted to try and build two different types of screw switch. One for the 150 gram class and one for the one pound class. I know that the Fingertech screw switch already exists, but I had some switches laying around my house. Shipping to Australia is very, very expensive, and I thought I would have a crack at making my own. But actually, let's start with the Fingertech screw switch and have a look at how that actually works because it does form the basis for some of the things we're actually going to be looking at today. So this is a Fingertech screw switch currently wired into a Melty Brain board and it's actually fairly simple. If you have a look on their website, you can see the internals of this thing. There's literally just two copper bars and a bolt. And the bolt runs through the top copper bar down into the second copper bar and just taps into both of those, making contact with both and linking the switch. And when you unscrew it, you basically just take the bolt out of the bottom copper bar and therefore there is an air gap between that and the screw and there is no more electric current flowing between the two. This is an interesting idea and a good way to do this, but it is kind of big for a 150 gram robot. It's doable, but I wanted something smaller, and that's where all of those PCBs that you saw at the start came in. Looking at that switch and how it worked, thinking about running a screw through a tapped hole that is also making contact with something, I wondered if that was possible to do in PCBs, and I realized that the same Melty Brain board that you just saw has a hole in it that is basically the exact size to be tapped with an M3 tap. And in doing so, I tapped it and put a bolt in there and realized that the bolt is making contact with that hole that it has been tapped through. And not only that, I didn't actually destroy the contact in here by tapping it. So I have designed three different PCBs here, and we're probably going to need to go down a little closer so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. So PCBs one and two are similar in concept, but different in execution. And PCB three is actually just a PCB version of the Fingertech switch. The whole idea on this board or these two boards is that this hole is connected directly to this pad and you solder a wire on this pad, you tap two of these, and then you just run a bolt through both of them. They would need a 3D printed mount between the two just to give you a bit of separation and stuff, but that's effectively what that is. It's a fairly cheap and easy re uh, recreation of that, which is a little bit lighter, theoretically. I haven't actually looked at that yet. We will build one of these together later in this video. One and two, you can see, are very, very similar in layout but they are doing things slightly differently. So both of them have a hole through the middle, a plated hole through the middle, but one has the plated hole connected to one side of the switch output terminals, and then these two pads here connected to the other side of the switch terminal. Number two here does not have the plated hole connected to anything at all. 
each of the two pads here is connected directly to one side of the switch terminal. So in this case, the power is going through the threads of the bolt up into the head of the bolt and then the head of the bolt touches one or both of these pads and completes the circuit. On the other side, the head of the bolt is the only thing that carries any current. It will touch, theoretically, touch both of these pads at the same time, passing current through. I don't like to as much because it relies on even contact pressure between the two, which relies on a straight and even tap down through the middle, which I think is going to be hard on these tiny, tiny little boards. And it's just going to be more fiddly to get exactly right. But I did this as an option just in case tapping this hole somehow manages to destroy it and we can't actually use the tapped hole as a contact point. We can and did on this PCB here, where I've tapped that hole and it does make electrical contact and connection with the rest of the ground plane, which is what it's actually tapped into at the moment. But these holes are ever so slightly different and don't have quite as much plating on them just because I wanted some gap between them and the contact pads on the outsides. Now, the other thing I did note by doing this is that this screw, I put a very large flat headed screw on here. And by screwing this all the way down, I doesn't actually make contact with this other contact here. So there's a secondary contact which should be underneath the head of the screw and in fact is underneath the head of the screw but there is not actually contact there which means that these two PCBs I'm going to have to put a tiny dob of solder on each one of these pads to give a little raised area for the screw to make contact. Okay, so the first one that we, I tried didn't tap particularly well. The second one has worked, but it looks like inside the actual hole itself, we've removed most of the plating. However, the plating still exists right down at the very bottom, which is good, because this is actually where it contacts the base of the board, and the base of the board is where it actually comes back and connects to this other hole. So we only need contact down the base of the board as long as the screw contacts that, that is going to be totally fine. So let's get a screw and run this in here. This screw is far too long for what we're doing, but as long as it does that, it should be fine. Also, as you can see, I am at a extreme angle. Uh, that's not particularly good. I should do this again and do it without quite such a crazy angle. However, having said that, the crazy angle, I'm not sure if this is gonna show up on camera, but it has lifted one side of the bolt head and pushed the other side of the bolt head into this other contact, which means this one might work without any solder on the contacts at all. It might actually just be fine. So I'm not gonna be able to get the multimeter in frame, but it's in connectivity mode, so you will hear this beeping if this bolt is actually connected. And literally all we need to do here, there is no contact between the two actual outer contacts. The bolt contacts one side, but not the other. Uh, it's not actually being picked up with enough contact, so we will need to put a tiny dot of solder on that to get that to work. So I tried to thread some of these off camera and it got worse. Out of the bunch that I threaded, a a whole lot of them had tear out at the back here. You can see these uh, silver rings that are starting to split up. That is the plating from the hole just being ripped out by the threading tool. And yeah, by the tap, I should say. And I think that is down to the fact that I am plating the hole really, really thin around the edges here. I pulled one of these other little guys that have a lot more plating and threading this was easy despite the fact that it's absolutely tiny i didn't get any tear out on either side on this one and i think that's because the plating is a lot further out the problem here is that you can't plate much further out and still have pads with a and sufficient enough air gap to actually make a switch work properly without it potentially arcing i think uh, so that's a little bit unfortunate, but it does mean that option two is actually still viable here. We can use the two extra pads and have a threaded hole in the middle, or in actual fact, what would probably even be better is to just 
run this hole as a three millimeter hole and have either a nut or a 3D print glued to the back which has thread in it. Probably a TPU piece because TPU grabs hold of bolts pretty well. So if you put a TPU piece back here, the thread will be perfectly straight and therefore you'll get contact on your two contacts properly. Two out of five, but it's actually three out of six because I have another one of these that is not actually here right now because it was my very first prototype of these that did actually work and I'll show you that again in a little bit. Uh, but like I said, we're gonna throw some solder on some pads. Okay, with that done, we can try our conduction test again. This time we have those soldered pads on there. So this should actually work this time. So we're just gonna screw this down. Look at that, that's great. So now if I back that screw out a little bit, doesn't take much, a couple of turns, nothing at all. Yeah, and then turn down. Perfect, all right, so that's screw switch num style number one. That was, this is the first one we did where the screw is just at an angle, which isn't great. So let's take a look at the second one that I did, other style of board where it needs to contact both sides at the same time. Let's see if we actually got this one to work. And look, already I'm not super sure the bolt is in at an angle again, because uh, again, tapping these is kind of difficult. So we're just gonna have to hope that this works. It does actually work. That is cool. Um, so that is probably an easier way to do this than the previous way, because it doesn't rely on that tapped hole being exact and precise, in actual fact, it really doesn't need that at all, which is actually good. That is interesting. That actually might be a better way to do it. I don't really know. I really need to do some actual proper, like, tests on this in terms of current carrying capacity and things. But for now, these have been fun little experiments. Okay, time to work on the micro finger tacks. Now, these are going to be interesting because the bolt needs to screw through everything, which the easiest way to make sure that the threads line up is to have them in place before we actually thread them so that they get threaded in situ, which means that everything should, in theory, line up correctly. I have printed these little mounting brackets that have got a gap in both sides that will square everything up around this central hole so that the bolt can run down in there. Uh, and it's also got some mounting spots for them as well. So hopefully this will do a good job. The only thing is that these have a tiny little kick out on one corner, which I will need to file off. It shouldn't be that difficult to do this, I don't think. It should just be a case of giving it a little scratch and then it should just slot into this little holder quite nicely. I am gonna glue these in, but that's actually quite tight as it is, and I think it is actually to do with that corner. In fact, I think it's both corners. Yeah, okay, there we go, cool. So that's got that basically done. I think too that my 3D print isn't perfect. It isn't perfect because of course there is an overhang inherent in this design, and so it's got to, uh, print some support materials. Admittedly, only a very, very small amount of support material, but support material nonetheless. Okay, so theoretically we have success on this and we should be able to feed this bolt that I've got in my hands all the way through these two parts and we should get a connection right at the end. So that is actually now, at least in theory, in the second board. So I do wanna test the connection, but hey, 
that is contact. So these PCB Fingertech style switches actually also work. They are slightly more involved and I would say slightly heavier than the other style, but they are easier to do and they don't require soldering on pads, which is kind of good. I'm not too sure how the contacts being blobs of solder is going to last on these particular boards. So that could be a thing to think about here. Uh, but weight is the other thing I want to think about. Okay, so for the plate, the single PCB switch, it is very, very light, 0.29 grams here. Uh, I also used this TPU block. It's kind of hard to see against the thing. This is a little TPU block that I glued underneath it, A, to keep the bolt down, and B, to give a mounting place for it. So that's that. Altogether, that's one gram. Uh, and then with the screw involved, it's one and a half. So that's pretty good. Uh, but as mentioned, these are slightly annoying to do and you have to be very, very careful not to completely destroy the plated through hole. So let's take a look at our other one here, which this is actually in PLA right now. So it's not actually the same material, uh, but PLA and TPU have very similar weight properties. So they should be fairly similar. Now let's throw this guy on 0.85. So actually underneath the size of this, however, this TPU block could have been shrunk down a little bit. Yeah, it was just this big to help mount it up, but I put the holes in this one to basically just screw bolts into it to put it straight into the chassis. And of course we need the screw involved as well. Okay, so they're about the same. You're talking points of a gram here uh, between the two. And honestly, this style is easier to make. Tapping of the PCBs works better on this style just because the plating on the holes is bigger and it can be bigger because I'm not relying on the head of the screw to do the contacting, which means I can put lots of plating there, which is nice. I did not expect two PCBs to come out lighter weight than the singular PCB. Uh, that is really, really interesting, especially when you're looking at blocks of um, plastic around them and stuff as well. I honestly thought that the thin PCB was going to be the better option of the two here. But having said all of that, I would not put these screw switches in a one pound robot. I don't think they have the current capa carrying capacity for that. These will work in an ant weight. I know this for a fact. I took this particular version with me to the most recent ARC event, had them running in my 150 gram Thagomizer build, while it was struggling to spin the weapon up and struggling to spin the weapon up for lots and lots of fights back to back, meaning it was drawing a lot of current and these didn't get warm at all. The battery got warm because it was giving too much current, but these actually worked out really well. So I'm pretty happy with all that. But having said that, I wouldn't put these in a one pound robot. So let's look at something for a one pound robot. So this one is going to be a little bit easier because it is not really using any tapping or any soldering apart from the regular soldering you would do to connect leads to this thing. It is simply converting a toggle switch like this into a screw switch like this. All we need is actually two 3D prints and a bolt. Okay, so here's our two 3D prints. This is a new top case for this switch, which is what we're going to do, is we're going to replace this entire top mechanism with a screw. And we have a tiny other little piece here, which is optional, but personally, I think it just makes life a little bit easier. Uh, it's very, very, very small, so it's not gonna take much time on a printer at all. I will say that this hole here is a threaded hole. It's a printed threaded hole. Uh, I might release the files to this. If I do and you're trying to print this, you need to print in exclusive tolerance mode if you're running Cura or Prusa Slicer. If you're running Bamboo Lab, it seems to just do this on its own and you can just print threads on it quite nicely, so that's fine. Uh, also, as mentioned, I might release these. It depends on uh, how these go in combat and also your comments below. There may be some updates to them before they need to be released. Uh, but also, if you do want them released, please throw a comment down below and let me know. So, 
I'm gonna do this real quick here because it is actually fairly easy. Literally all we need to do is bust this case open, which is super, super simple to do. Screwdriver in under here and lift it up on both sides. Uh, and then once that's done, basically you leverage it back until it lets go. And as soon as that happens, things will go flying because there is a spring in here that will release. Oh, this one didn't actually do that. Okay, well that's cool. There we go, and then there's a spring coming out of the handle right now. So the spring goes all the way up in the handle and then this little rocker piece joins in underneath the handle and that's how you do the switching because in here there is a little plate that rocks back and forth. So at the moment, so if I push it down on this side, it's making contact between the middle pin and the end pin, and if I push it back the other way, down that side, uh, then it will make contact with this pin down here. So that's how these switches work. They're really, really simple. There's literally just a little rocket in here. So all we are gonna do is we're gonna use this spring and we're gonna force one side down. And that side is just gonna correspond with wherever you put the spring side on the new lid cap that we've made and then you're gonna put this other tiny little piece on the edge of the spring just so it doesn't slide down next to the rocker that's in here, you can see that. Uh, so with those two things, literally what happens is that when this all gets installed, the spring pushes the rocker down to one side, that will be your unconnected side, so you choose whichever one it is. In my case, it will be this particular side here, we're just gonna lop that off after we're done here because uh, we don't need this anymore, and it will be connected to the middle pin constantly when the switch isn't done, uh, isn't closed. And then on the other side will just be the screw. So the screw will wind down, push the rocker against the spring, forcing it down into the other contact and connecting those two together, making it a switch. Uh, so this is really, really simple. All we're gonna do, glue this spring in here, glue the top on the spring, and then glue the entire section down over like this. It clips in quite nicely. Now this bit is possibly the trickiest part of this build because you basically just have to sit here and hold the glue until the glue dries because at the moment there is a spring trying to push this lid and the base of this switch apart and you cannot let that happen until that glue dries. So I'm just gonna sit here now. Okay, so once that's dry, I have run a tap through this. You should be able to get this with exclusive tolerance mode and maybe running a bolt through it before you glue it all together because I didn't do that. Uh, it was just a little bit stiff when I tried to put a bolt into it earlier, so I've just run a tap through it. Again, you shouldn't need to do this. I then now take a longer bolt than we're using for the small PCBs because we need something that's going to go all the way to the bottom here and push that rocker down into this other contact. Now, until it bottoms out, which hopefully it actually, oh, I don't know, the screw might not be quite long enough, but there's one way to find out. We are going to try the contacts again, this time, just this side. No, okay, so our screw is not long enough. We need a longer screw. Okay, turns out it didn't need to be that much longer. This one is just a tiny, tiny little bit longer, enough that it's not bottoming out, and now, we do indeed have our screw switch active. Now, if I take this and I back this screw out, like a turn, there you go, literally nothing. Okay, I've got a better setup here so I can actually control how things are going. I've got alligator clips connecting everything back to my multimeter off screen here, uh, so I can actually now work on just getting it to actually connect. and disconnect. And it's actually about a quarter of a turn, which is good, because it means the spring inside here is powerful enough that it's overcoming 
the screw and everything and it's like actually working the way it's in well the way I'm intending it to so it's not a lot to get it in and it's not a lot to back it out as well so that is really really good I quite like this I'm going to keep using this in one pounders I reckon because uh, I only fight one very specific one pounder as a triple multi bot and this is going to be perfect for that these donor switches that I've used to make these screw switches have a current rating on them of something very low under 10 amps so I really wouldn't be using this on like an ant weight or like a one pound spinner or even a beetle weight spinner and actually fact, I probably wouldn't use these in beetle weights at all but for a one pound hammer robot or drive bot it's probably going to be fine so there we have it we've been kind of tight down on the desk all day working on those three different types of screw switch now i will probably end up putting files out into the world for two of them uh, i don't know which form of the screw switch i want to do yet i do need to do some more testing and even some destructive testing on basically the lot of them just to see uh, if they're really actually safe for combat robots. As mentioned, I have run them in a robot, uh, well, at least one of the styles of ant weight, or 150 gram ant weight screw switch, and that worked out pretty well. So I think I will be releasing files eventually, uh, but I want to get feedback off of you first. If there's something I've missed here that could be an issue, please let me know in the comments down below and I will read through all of those and see if there's anything that I need to correct or change or update. Uh, and if there is, I will do that. And if not, I will probably just throw the files up. So if you want those files, make sure you're subscribed and check the community posts every now and again, because it will probably be through a community post that I upload all of these files and then tell you about it. Uh, I might also discuss it at the end of a future video, but it will be right the very way at the back, like right about now as we're talking here. So that is where we're sitting with those. These have been interesting. I think these are going to work pretty well. As mentioned, one of them has already survived in an ant weight, so I'm pretty happy about that. I think with the ant weight style ones, the 150 gram ones, I could probably have SMD LEDs on them, especially the bigger boards, not the... PCB finger tech style ones. On the bigger boards, I could probably add an extra thing to add ground in and then let you run an LED. So it's a little screw switch and LED all in one go. I would just need to perfect the plated through holes on those so that they don't die as easily as the ones I've done. Anyway, that is going to be it for this video. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed that one and I will see you in the next video.